All right, thank you for joining us for this Bible study. You know, you must understand that you are Haman in the eyes of our enemy because they're going to try and paint you out to be an evil, hateful, dangerous villain just because you stand up for the truth of God's Word. And you know what? It's already happening. Christian patriots, Tea Party members, are now being called terrorists by the left. And I know you've probably heard of them by now, but uh, the hate crimes laws, laws that are being put in place today in America and around the world that make it a crime just to teach certain parts of God's Word. And concerning Haman, you might want to know that during some Purim celebrations, oftentimes Haman, or, or a doll representing Haman, is burned and even crucified on that day, on that celebration. And to many, Haman has now, to many who celebrate that holiday today, Haman has now come to represent Jesus Christ and his followers. Guess what? That means you. You are Haman in their eyes. So it's important to understand this book if we want to be one step ahead of our enemies. But before we begin, please listen for a brief moment as we share something with you. If you thought the plagues God sent upon Egypt were something, wait until you see what God brings upon those who are deceived into worshiping Satan and his new world order that is arising today. I'll tell you this, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials, and yes, even the seven thunders are going to make the ten plagues of Egypt look like child's play. Because they are going to be the greatest earth-shattering events that man will ever witness. And more than likely, you will live to see them, for that time is drawing near as we see the nations of the world fall into economic distress and many other troubles. So find out how all this is going down by ordering our 11 DVD set on the seals, trumpets, and vials of the Great Book of Revelation. This step-by-step -step series of studies is available from our website at ChristianOvercomers.com. And when you order this set, we will ship it to you for free and even include a free study guide that will help you understand the chronological order of these great events. Order online today at ChristianOvercomers.com. All right, welcome back. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth that you have sent to us so that we can know and understand what tomorrow brings. Please help give us eyes to see and ears to hear into your plan so that we can be better servants of yours, ready to help others. In Yeshua, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, turn with me if you would to Esther chapter 7 verse 1. And if you've been following along, I don't have to tell you that Haman is being set up by Esther the queen, or I should say Esther the false queen. And we're going to pick it up, um, 7 verse 1, and it reads, So the king and Haman came to the banquet with Esther the queen. And I'm going to mention this again. I haven't mentioned it for a while, but the name Esther is merely a modification of Ishtar, a Babylonian sex goddess. And why is that important? Well, for one, we know that Esther is not a hero, like many silly Christians uh, try and uh, make her out to be. But her and Mordecai are rather the villains and co-conspirators of this book um, who want to uh, bring vengeance, a bloodthirsty vengeance upon any who get in their way of gaining world power, world dominance. And um, I'll also mention this. I believe she is none other, or she is one, one in the same as Mystery Babylon, that great harlot of the book of Revelation who seduces the kings of the earth. Just like Esther seduced this king here, King Ahasuerus, 
to gain political power and influence. And, and uh, there's one other thing that Mystery Babylon was also responsible of, of which we'll see a perfect type played out here by Esther, is that she was responsible for the persecution and the murder of God's servants, Christians. And um, so I just had to point that out because Ishtar, Esther is none other than Ishtar, the great Babylonian goddess. It's just a code, it's basically, it's just a code name that her enemies used to represent her so they could communicate with each other and, um, and well, dupe the rest of us if they could. So verse 2, And the king said unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be, and it shall be performed even to the half of the kingdom. Now that's, that's quite, a bit, uh, quite a bit that the king's willing to give her. And remember back from the prior chapters, he was willing to give her that because... She used flattery and sexual seduction to manipulate the mind of the king. And we talked about how the, the Kenites used that method of operation over and over and over again. Um, and, and that's how we got to this point. But she's kind of dragging us along. This is the second banquet that Esther has been to with the king. And she still hasn't told the king what her desire was. And now she's finally going to do it. Verse 3, Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. Verse 4, For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. Remember, we've documented without a shadow of a doubt that this whole book is fictional. These things never happened in history. And matter of fact, not, not uh, Jesus Christ, I should say it this way, um, Jesus Christ never acknowledged Esther. Neither has any of God's apostles or any other servant of God. Surely if Esther and Mordecai were such great heroes, They'd be mentioned somewhere else in the Bible, but they're not. But they're not. And we're not going to go into that. We've already documented that point. But I, I bring that up to, uh, to illustrate that they like to play like they're so persecuted. Oh, everybody's out to get us. There's a villain around the corner that's always trying to destroy us. Why? Why do they do that? Because when they cry out that they're so persecuted... And they cry out anti-Semitism, this and that. It works as both a shield and a sword for them. Because it shields them while they are committing atrocities. Um, such as, uh, well, I should say, the, the problems we're having today with the Federal Reserve System and the banking and the economy. Well, it gives them the chance to continually yield, uh, wield their attacks upon our people. Because if anybody says anything against them for what they are doing, they are automatically labeled and slandered as a hateful villain, as, as, a, as a hateful Haman. So she says here, We are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain. And you know what this, this brings up? This brings to my mind, for those of you with eyes to see and ears to hear, the plots and plans during World War II. Think about that. Think about that. Always crying out uh, the genocide. They're trying to destroy us. And you know what? I'm going I'm to add this in. I mentioned hate crimes laws in the introduction. They're, they're making it more and more so that even just, let's, let's take for example, teaching Romans chapter 1, where God says it's an abomination to commit homosexual acts. It is now being considered, and um, by many who are trying to draft this legislation, their aim is to make it so that it is a crime just to teach against, or I should say it this way, 
it is considered genocide just to teach against homosexuality as being an abomination because they say, well, it breeds the ground for, for genocide. So in other words, just thinking and standing up for the truth of God's word could label you as a hate criminal. And I mentioned before, Jesus Christ wouldn't have lasted um, more than 30 minutes on this earth today because he would be labeled, slandered, and hanged as a hate criminal. Think about that. Well, I guess he, he kind of was already before, wasn't he? After his three and a half year ministry, he was crucified. Upon that cross, he was treated like a criminal. Even though he was righteous and he just, all he did was speak the truth. Along with coming to save others from their sins. Again, you know, when you're wearing that, when, when you're, uh, well, I'll say, I'm going to say this. When Christ uh, mentioned in the Gospels that we are to take up our cross and follow him, it didn't just mean that we are to wear a cross around our neck. No, it, it means that you are going to be willing, that you should be willing to be treated like a criminal by the entire world. As you stand up for the truth, that you be willing to take it, that you be willing to endure it. Because those times are coming. And again, like we already said, they're already happening. Just, just for standing up for the word of God, we are now being called criminals, terrorists, psychotics, you name it. Because they're trying to scare us away from society. They're trying to marginalize us. We're not going to put up with it. Because we know we win in the end. But it's important to understand how they plan on doing this to us. And let's continue on. So she says, but if we had been sold, back in verse 4, but if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my tongue. I wouldn't have said anything. Although the enemy could not prevail the king's damage. In other words, she says, oh, all my people are being sold to be destroyed. They're going to commit genocide against us. But if they wanted to just make us slaves, I, would, I wouldn't have said anything then. But I must say something now. Oh, poor, poor Esther. Verse 5. Th this is probably the most important verse in this book. Because it lets us know that God is in control. And there's a message for us here. And it's important to understand because we're going to see the fifth acrostic. It's actually the fourth in order, but it's fifth because it's a different type of acrostic than the other four. And we're going to read it here. Then the king Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he and where is he? that does presume in his heart to do so. Who is this person that wants to commit genocide against your people? Well, right off the bat, we already know, according to this book, that the king knew it was that it was Haman that wanted to have uh, Mordecai and his people taken care of because, uh, because of what they were doing to the nation. So we, why do I mention that? Because there are holes in this book. That let us know that it doesn't flow. It's not actually, it didn't actually ever happen. And uh, there are just little parts like this that stick out. The, the king already, he would have already known. He already knew. But for the sake of this make-believe story, let's go on. Who is he and where is he? Those words there entail this special acrostic. Because the final letter of each of those words in the Hebrew now think now listen closely. The final words, the final letters in those words spell out the sacred name of God, Iya. Aleph He Yod He Iya. And that was the sacred name that has been translated as I am. Remember back when uh, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, where Moses said to God, Wh whom shall I say sent me? Who, what, what is your name, God? What, what's the name that I can give to the people? 
And God said, I am that I am, or Iya Asha Iya. Why is that important? Because here we see the sense of hum God's sense of humor. Along with pointing out to us that the writer of this book was not one of God's servants. He was one of God's enemies. Because check this out. Who is he and where is he? Is where the acrostic lays. But you know what the answer is? I am. Meaning, God has given the answer here that he is the one that's going to destroy Mordecai and his people, the Kenites. And you're going to find that in... Um, Revelation chapter 16, we're going to turn there in the battle of Armageddon. Um, let's turn to Revelation chapter 16, verse 1. And you know, it, it gives me comfort and peace of mind. And it, what's, 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 uh, why, why I said it was, a, a, it displayed God's sense of humor was because it came out of the mouth of the king, but yet it was penned by Mordecai the Kenite, or a Kenite who wrote this book. And that Kenite had no idea that he just answered his own question within that verse. That God was the Almighty God, the great I Am, was going to be the one to take care of them. To take care of those true villains, Esther and Mordecai and their people. Um, Revelation 16, verse 16, And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. Verse 18, And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not, since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. Verse 19, and the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon, remember Esther and Mordecai, both Babylonian goddesses, the ones in control of this great Babylon, came in remembrance before God to give unto her Mystery Babylon, Esther, Ishtar, the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. In other words, who is he and where is he that, that does presume in his heart to do so? Is the great I am, almighty God. And every island fled away and every mountains and the mountains were not found and there fell upon men. A great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. Okay, that was just one, uh, one of the prominent places to explain what God meant here in this verse by placing his sacred name there. You see, God even directs and controls the minds of our enemy. He's in control of everything. And that gives us peace of mind and comfort. Because... When we see things get out of hand, we see things get crazy. We know that ultimately it isn't our enemy that's in control. Even though they think they are. It's Almighty God. And um, I'm going to turn to one other place concerning this acrostic. Matthew chapter 13. Many of you are familiar with this. Concerning the tares that were sown in the field by the wicked one. And uh, this is what uh, Jesus says here. And he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. True Israelites. The true sons of Judah. Not the false. Not like Haman and Mor uh, not like uh, Esther and Mordecai. Verse 38. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. 
The enemy that sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. You know, they always cry out, oh, they want to they wanna destroy all of our people. But you know what? There is a time coming that the tares will actually be gathered up and burned in the fire. Verse 41, So the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and, and, which, and them which do iniquity. Verse 42, And shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. This is the time when there will really be a great furnace to take care of all of God's enemies, especially these Kenites. And who's going to do it? God's going to do it. The great I Am, just as he answered us in this verse here, back in Esther chapter 7, verse 5. And in my mind, this sets the seal upon this book to give us, without a shadow of a doubt, that this whole book is reversed. The characters the characters are in reverse and how fascinating it is um, back to Esther chapter 7 verse 6 and Esther said the adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen and I'm going to say it again you are the adversary and the enemy you are Haman because you stand in the way of Esther and Mordecai's people from trying to build their new world order. You know what? Even George Soros himself says that uh, the only thing standing in the way standing in the way of building a new world order is America. And you know why? It's because of those of you who are standing up for the for the testimony of Jesus Christ as well as the commandments of God. True Christian patriots, you're the ones that are making a difference. You're the ones that are holding a line of righteousness. So when they try to paint you as a Haman, just relax and know from, um, I believe it's Matthew, um, well, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, that Christ said, hey, um, well, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to turn there really quick since we're there. And then we're going to speed up and end the study because we're going to do another one right away and we're going to break it up into two segments. Um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Christ speaking, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, now don't overread that. When you're persecuted for doing what's right, you're going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. That means you're going to inherit a great um, position of responsibility even because you've earned it. Verse 11, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. When they call you Haman, when they call you a villain, just remember that you are blessed Every time that they do that, God is keeping record. He's keeping score. And you're going to be paid tremendously for that. As verse 12 says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Hey, they did it to the prophets. They've done it throughout history. Anytime a true servant of God, like you, stands up and boldly proclaims the truth, the world doesn't like it, but you know what? God does, and he loves you for it. Because there are not too many who are willing to put their neck out on the line for the truth of Almighty God. But praise God, many are doing it today. And we're, I think we're seeing an awakening happening among our people, among our nation. And, 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 it's, and it's wonderful to see. So, verse 7, And the king arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath went into the palace garden, and Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen, 
For he saw, now check this out. This is the last acrostic in the book. He saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. In those words, that there was evil determined against him, um, is the acrostic spelling the, the sacred name of God, Yahweh. Y-H-V-H. This time it's used forward to let us know that this is true. There is evil determined against us by our enemies, by the enemies of Christianity and freedom, by the Kenites, the serpent seed. And he's letting us know, hey, these things, these things are going to happen. Be prepared for them. It's part of taking up your cross and being a Christian. It's just part of the, it's part of the game. Well, I shouldn't say it's part of the game because it's, it's a very serious thing. It's part of your role part of your duty but you know well I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit here but uh, so he, he comes up in his wrath he's all mad at, at Haman here and, and now he's out to get him here verse 8 then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place well I'm going to mention this I actually forgot to mention it so Haman's over here now begging the queen to save his life. And I'm going to mention this because earlier, while well, the prior chapter in chapter 6, Haman got duped into having to parade Mordecai around telling everybody how great he was. And now, now he's at the feet begging the other co-conspirator for his life. You see, there's often a trend there among our people. When, oftentimes, someone will speak up for the truth. And they will be persecuted by Mordecai and his people, the Kenites. And then they'll come crawling back to them, begging, Oh, please, please, please don't, uh, don't ruin my career. And they basically worship at the feet of Satan, trying to buy their, trying to buy their um, comfort. trying to beg and plead that the Kenite would not, uh, would not harm them anymore. You know what? We don't beg and plead with the Kenites. We stand against them. We stand against them just like David did against Goliath. We don't compromise. We don't make deals with the enemy. We defeat the enemy. And I say this because this has happened over time. And you know what? I'm going to mention this. There's one prominent uh, conservative political commentator that, that has done a lot of good but who is being set up to be a Haman. And he doesn't even realize it because right now he's, he's going and parading around, celebrating, honoring the people of Mordecai. He's honoring this false Zionist movement today and even trying to gather many people to go along and be with them, to fall into the role of Haman. Because you know what? Those same people that that political commentator is putting up on a pedestal are the same people that are going to seek his destruction. And you know what? Knowing this book of Esther and having eyes to see and ears to hear, we can, we can be on guard from that. We can be aware of that. And it's sad to see someone fall into that role because th those people care nothing for that man. They care nothing for that man. And I'm speaking of the Kenites who have mixed in with the tribe of Judah and who claim to be Jews and who are not, but who are of the synagogue of Satan, Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. So verse 8, And then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine. And keep in mind, he's pretty angry at this time. And Haman was fallen upon the bed Whereon Esther was. Oh my goodness. Could it, could it be any, could it go any worse for Haman? Could it, you know, I'm going to say this. When the Kenites have you under their scope and you start compromising, you start begging and pleading for them to, uh, to be nice to you. 
there's you're gonna there's gonna be one thing after the other. Your downfall is gonna continually spiral because you're not putting your trust in God. And that that's what we see happening to Haman. Now it's looking as though, well, it's gonna say it here. Then the king said, Will he force the queen also before me in my house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And Harbona, interesting name here, means ass driver. One of the chamberlains said before the king, Behold also the gallows, uh, behold, uh, I'm sorry, behold also the gallows 50 feet high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who, he, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. And then the king said, Hang him there on hang him immediately so the king hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai then was the king's wrath pacified and you know what this king is an idiot he's a fool and and I say that because he doesn't realize that all the way from chapter one he was he's been played He's actually become the puppet of Esther and Mordecai. They, they are just pulling his strings on either side, along with, of course, Mordecai's shadow government, uh, the king's advisors that surrounded him. So he's all angry. He's got, he, now he's going to execute Haman just because he had been played. And you know what? Our leaders are no different today. They are played on constantly by the Kenites to persecute um, their own people who are trying to save the nation. I'm speaking of the Tea Party and other and Christian patriots, those who stand up for the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Our leaders are now trying they're being many of them are being convinced and duped into thinking that somehow we are the problem and not them. Amazing. Amazing. So I guess to recap this chapter, this is what they want to do to you, my friend. They want to make you out to be a Haman, and they want to destroy you. Because Haman to them represents Christians and those who stand up for the truth, those who stand in the way of them forming their socialistic one-world government. And like Christ said, um, in Matthew, I believe it's, uh, well, I think it was Matthew chapter 4. He said that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of the Lord. So see that you consume it. See that you partake of it and digest it so that you can be a Christian overcomer.